Good morning, and welcome to First Congregational Church. Uh, first off, happy Father's Day to you all. Um, my words would be to keep showing up as peacemakers in the lives of uh, the children in, in your life. And keep being an example of what the love of God looks like. There are a couple of uh, announcements today. Um, but first, if you're joining First Congregational Church for the first time, and especially if you're joining for the first time over Zoom, uh, welcome. We are glad that you are here. And uh, someday soon when we are able to meet together, we will uh, see you then. The bulletin is on the website at FCCAK.org. It's about halfway down the front of the homepage uh, under This Week in Worship. You can open that up and view it or print it uh, if that's more convenient. The words for the service, especially the unison prayers and things like that, and the hymns will be um, shared up on your screen when the time comes as well. Your microphone is now muted. During the prayer requests, if you would like to share something uh, for me to read aloud to everyone, uh, please share that in the chat. Um, also, if you would like to speak during the prayers, just uh, type in the chat that you would like your microphone unmuted, and we'll make sure that happens. Feel free to turn your camera on and off as it is convenient for you. <clears throat> Unfortunately, if you run into technical difficulties, we will not pause the service. If you have persistent problems, though, uh, during the week, if you let myself or the office know, then we can uh, try to work with you to get that uh, worked out. If, by chance, your device is being slow or your internet is just not what it should be, you can always join the service by audio using your phone, either your cell phone or your home phone. For our announcements, um, today is a church council meeting. We'll start uh, immediately following the service. <clears throat> if you would like to join that meeting, even if you're part of council normally, please, for my own help, type council in the chat after the service ends, so I'll know who to send to that room. Everyone else, if you kind of sit tight for about 30 seconds or so, uh, you'll be randomly assigned to uh, different breakout rooms so where we can uh, chat and discuss uh, with one another. I will be taking some time off the next two weeks. Uh, next week on the 28th, uh, one of my best friends, Reverend P uh, Brett Palmer, will be uh, joining via Zoom to preach. Uh, he and I uh, graduated seminary together. He serves Freedon's United Church of Christ in Marissa, Illinois. On July 5th, the following week, our very own Eric Johnson will be preaching for us. So we have a couple of uh, good weeks coming up. We also still need uh, liturgists to read scripted parts for those two services. So if that's something that you uh, feel comfortable doing or want to try for maybe the first time, um, this would be a, a good, good opportunity. All of those parts, as I said, are scripted. You are able to adapt those to your own voice, of course, uh, but you don't have to create something uh, for the service. You can sign up for that uh, on the daily update, either the one from this last Friday or the one coming out on Tuesday. And as soon as we have people signed up, Crystal will send out those scripts to people. There are a couple of um, other, maybe more long-term events are coming up shortly. Uh, this next Saturday is Walton Island's the Sol uh, Solstice Party. And uh, it's, as of right now, plan to arrive about 10 a.m. or so. Um, you can RSVP to the office, either by calling, and if there's no one here that day, you can leave a message or you can send an email. If you need instructions and directions, let the office know, and Crystal will send um, a map out to you with all those directions. More information will be um, in the Tuesday update on that as well. And in the more distant future, uh, a few weeks away, uh, we will be doing our Value Village fundraiser. And it's coming up on July 11th is the day when we will make that uh, move from things here to Value Village. And they're paying by the pound, and it's complicated. Um, there will be detailed instructions coming out again on the Tuesday daily update. So you probably should read that one, it's an important one. And it'll have some ideas about what they are accepting, those sorts of things, when to drop it off. The plan is to maybe be able to drop it off the week before so that on that Saturday there aren't, uh, we minimize the number of people that are sort of uh, around on that particular day. So we'll have some instructions on that. 
Um, there are uh, a few updates for the uh, church property. We did uh, ch uh, chip up uh, a lot of trees that we had cut down, uh, dead spruce trees um, and things like that. So there are two big piles of wood chips, and Jim and Amal and I uh, spent a day doing that this last week. So if you need some fresh wood chips at your, at your house or someplace, um, you are welcome to come get some. There's one pile when you first come in the lower parking lot right against the parking lot. It's really easy access. And there's a second pile that's uh, back into the backyard, back in the trees. Um, so if you want some wood chips, um, feel free to come by and get them. And speaking of uh, wood chips, I want, I want to read an email. Jim, I didn't ask permission to read this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so yesterday I was here picking up some wood chips for a compost pile. I needed some more brown stuff. And I was here, and Jim was here, and he was uh, putting together the raised bed in the top yard. It go, the, the newest little raised bed section will be right up against the upper parking lot where they push the snow uh, back in those, lo those longer spaces. And it's right where that rhubarb plant is in front of hospice. So uh, Jim had been constructing that, and Crystal and I showed up, and we helped him sort of get it framed up and stabilized. And then we checked out some plants around, and then Chris, or Crystal and I left. And then I got an email later that evening. It said, uh, Jacob and Crystal, as soon as you left this evening, I was trying to square up the raised bed, and it collapsed on me, the toes of my right foot, to be precise. So I hobbled over to try to catch you before you left, to see if I could get you to help me stand it up again. But I missed you. So I had to undo the end pieces I had put on while you were there and lift it up again by myself. The 45-minute cloudburst did not help. I had, to take it all, I had to take in all of my electric tools while it was raining, but the raised bed is now together and pretty solid. However, by the time I got that far, I was too tired to try planting it in the ground and start work leveling it. So it is still sitting in the parking lot. The next time I have the opportunity, I will put it in the ground and then arrange the bed and get a load of dirt scheduled. Jim's a trooper with an injured foot. Hopefully he's resting now. Um, anyway, you should come by and check, check these new additions out. It's still sitting in the parking lot today, uh, but it should be in the ground and doing something here pretty soon. Make sure and check the announcements in the bulletin. There are a few. Um, they also give, give instructions on how to connect throughout the week with our different uh, activities and fellowship activities and programs. Um, so make sure and look at that. Now let our service continue. The sun shines more brightly. Its warmth stays with us for so many more hours. In this new moment, we wander about the wilderness, hoping God will open our eyes, praying God will make us worthy, wanting to grow with God. For our musical offering, members of the choir have recorded um, a piece for us. Thank you. 
Thank you, choir, for sharing it again. Um, wonderful music for us. <clears throat> Next few weeks, I think we'll have even some uh, reruns of recordings of music that we have shared in the past when um, uh, before all of the coronavirus stuff happened and we were able to play as whole ensembles. So we're working on that. Um, so there's a couple of good things to, to look forward to in the next couple of weeks. For our children's moment, uh, Lynn, uh, Barbara has, is going to share with us. So children, adults, whoever's listening, I want to tell you a few facts, not in any particular order of importance. The first fact, as I'm sure most of you who are listening probably know, is I am a bird watcher. See, binoculars, I have them with me most of the time. Second important fact is I am a member of this church. So imagine my excitement when I realized the third fact that the Bible story today talks about birds. Yes. So in particular, it talks about sparrows, and you'll hear about it soon. Um, I expect most of you have an idea about what a sparrow is. Um, it's typically a little brown, plain bird. Now I've got some pictures of sparrows. There are many, many different kinds of sparrows. So here are some sparrows. Those are all different species of sparrows. They're little brown things, okay? So what kind of little brown thing do you think it is? How big is it? Well, see this little potato? That's about the size of a sparrow, except the sparrow is skinnier. If a sparrow is like this size with a tail on one end and a head on the other end. Um, in the wild, there are lots of sparrows. The Bible says that God knows when the, any sparrow falls to the ground. All of these little sparrows, God knows about it, which is amazing. I mean, I know about a lot of sparrows, but I don't know about all of them. But what's even more amazing is that the Bible says we are even more valuable than the sparrows. God knows what happens to each of us. And the most important fact of all the facts is that God values and loves each of us, each of you listening today and all other people. Very good news. End of story. Amen. Thanks, Lynn. And Lynn will be joining us again to uh, share the scripture reading a little bit later, which will um, speak about the sparrows and us. For our offering today, the instructions, uh, as we uh, talk about each week, you, um, if you would like to make a, an offering or um, a pledge payment, you can mail those to the church, or you can drop them in the mail slot, or you can um, click on the give in the top right corner of the church's homepage and give a one-time or recurring uh, gift or, or pledge payment. I've said this multiple times uh, in the last couple months, that things are still very much uh, happening, and I am highly uh, suspect of any, any news or headlines that say that the church is not able to be the church right now. I could not disagree more. Um, there are people having picnics um, at a distance in the lower garden area. 
I mean, there are people working on things around the church. You could see from the video to the, the, um, that we shared, the choir shared, that sometimes people will come in in a very small numbers and record something in the sanctuary. We're still having our, our meetings online. I mean, the list goes quite on and on. So we, we continue in, in persistent faith that the church remains on it. Um, that we who, who comprise the body of Christ are not faltered, are not stilted by anything um, that may shake us. That we persist in the way of Jesus. For our dedication of gifts. Grow these gifts in your love, God. Bless our offerings our hearts and our hopes in your love to make us worthy of your work in the world. Fill these gifts and each of us with your goodness. Amen. And we come in silence, open to the way of Christ among us. And we rest pacing our breath in the midst of the spirit with us. You who walk upon our path before we have the words to respond or the eyes to even see, await our reaching, catching up, trying to pace our steps after your sure stride. For long this life of early sprouting and as full of promise as fiddlehead ferns out of damp soil and the cover of shade, we arrive, we await just the right time to step into your way. Through seasons overgrown with cow parsnip along narrow paths that leave scars on our spirit, we preserve in the knowing that you have felt the burning of harsh words, the itching of missed opportunities, the pain of harm resting heavy on the shoulders. For you await the triumph of days when the sun sets softly upon our skin, when smiles color our face with confidence and the open air fills our lungs with the breath that reminds us of the first breath of life you breathed into the ground that we rest upon. And yet pacing, pressing on, full of trouble and hope, wrapped up in mixed expectations and dread. We find ourselves never far from your shadow of protection and peace. And into your grasp, we finally reach. Into your care, O oh God, we remain forever following and the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me for our first him draw us in the spirit's tether it's number 392 in the hymnal or page six or uh, with words on your screen <laughs>
we'll share our scripture reading together. Lynn, you are ready. Okay. The scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 through 39. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have come to bring, not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. There are a few gospel readings that are more, um, I would say, distressing than that one. So I've, um, but there are also within that reading a number of very familiar phrases or quotes. I'm not sure what that says about the history of the church. This has been a common reading for the church for a long time, especially used as um, weaponized against people. But there are some very familiar lines talking about hairs counted on our head. There is the reversal of bring not peace, but a sword. There is the a uh, familiar quoted phrase from Micah 7, that there will be a disruption to the social order and to family, familial fabrics, uh, where uh, children and parents will have great discord, the prophetic speaking to the days to come. And there, of course, is maybe the most familiar of all of the quotes in this reading, those who find will lose their life and those who lose their life into Jesus will find their life. So these quotes are familiar, but they are found in the midst of this real disturbing narrative in Matthew. The whole section of Matthew is not pleasant. It's troubling and difficult to feel good about. I mean, what is the good news if it is primarily disruptive and discomforting? The honest truth is that following Jesus means accepting the suffering and death as part of a life full of resurrection. These two sides are never completely separate, never that far apart, even if we would like them to be. See, even before his death, and of course Matthew speaking back later, Jesus knew that his way was not going to be free of suffering or trouble. And if those who were with him, wanted to follow him, but they would not avoid the same. It was never going to 
be peace like they may have thought. It's never going to be peace as the absence of tension, but a trudge in a creative peace that takes real work and determination and has a price. After all, if Jesus were really the enlightened and affirming nice guy we often insist on imagining, should he not have been able to stay out of trouble? I mean, what incited people to call him such names? Prince, not of peace in this case, but of demons, as in verse 25. Why would follow him, following him wreck families? How did he end up on a cross, for that matter? The answer is not that his opponents had strange and unsettling ideas, but he did. And contrary to many popular opinions and best-selling books, not everything the follower, the follower of Jesus needs to know can be learned in kindergarten. See, a sort of working of the Spirit, the realm of God, that sort of work, it turns out, is more controversial and subversive than conventional kindness. And so Matthew says, if the teacher gives offense, how much more the student? Of course, giving offense is no great trick. I can say mean things. Anyone can say mean things just to be shocking. And it's no sure sign of faithfulness. True discipleness, discipleship is the art of seeking the kingdom with single-minded determination and letting the chips fall where they may. See, it comes down to this. As the church, if we always manage to glide through life without ever rubbing anyone the wrong way, we may have reason to question whether it is truly this Jesus of Matthew that we honor or follow. The gospel did not come only for days of peace, but for days of struggle. And we have seen and are in the midst of struggle right now. I have preached multiple times specifically about the reckoning of white supremacy in our communities and churches, the work of the Spirit lurking in the ongoing struggle for the redemption of racism in America and all sorts of upheavals that we see we continue to wade through a unfortunate and seemingly manufactured cultural war about masks and herd immunity during an unconcerned pandemic. Decisions about basic courtesies and how we will gather or fall along partisan lines. But none of this is to decide if we are still the church. It's simply how do we keep one another safe while doing so. This is the discomforting truth about the way of Jesus in a fractured social fabric, one like we are experiencing. See, what was passable before as peace, when there really was no peace, is now glaringly obvious, a broken peace. There is no way to walk together as the church and not be disruptive right now. Everything is electric and full of energy, energy that can burn, as easily as enlightened. Everything holds the potential of the sword. There is no way to avoid it right now. See, following in the way of Jesus in this moment will likely not feel much like peace in the days to come. And to force a peace in this moment that is not really there is to not know who Jesus is as if we never knew. So what do we make of a faith that requires every ounce of who we are and even calls us to join in the suffering of Christ? To reject peace when there is no peace. The sword this time until the peace of Christ arrives. What do we make of the struggle when we do not yet see the way out? See, there rests in this same reading of disruption a very simple phrase. Do not be afraid. 
Fear not. And for me, if there is a phrase that holds the gospel together all at once, it is this one. Do not be afraid. Let the way of Jesus be what it will be. Because even though it is true that we are in the midst of transition like few others in our lifetimes, fear is not, it will not be, the driving force of what God is doing, even if it seems to be driving us. Fear is a distraction from the possibility of love. Be persistently following in the way of Jesus through moments full of fear and disruption is a determination toward hope that the promise of resurrection is worth the struggle it takes to arrive there. And we say, may it be so. Even more than that, the gospel declares that we are not to fear, especially when there is legitimate reason to be afraid. Not fearing when there isn't much to fear is not exactly groundbreaking. Not fearing implies that there are real troubles afoot. Do not fear, for the love and care of God is not swayed by this day or the next, by past misdeeds, ingrained ignorance, or current ridiculousness. It is into the days of trouble that God finds us with overwhelming care. So my dad tells this story when he was a child giving for church. And hair was apparently of central concern. Fortunately, this was not my experience as a child, even though I do have calyx everywhere. But for him and my grandmother, hair combed down tight, real tight, honestly too tight, pasted to the scalp. As if, if Sunday could redeem a child's out-of-control hair, perhaps it would stick for the rest of him. It didn't. See, but not even the strongest prayer can keep every hair in line with a body that can't stand still. So my grandmother would resort to the worst of all parenting acts slick back with a lick of her hand, the out-of-control crops of hair with excessive care, so much so to drive the annoyance of a child beyond repair. So I can imagine that almost every child in this situation has the same reaction, to squirm and to move, that this sort of care is not welcome. To count all the hairs on our head is beyond even useful. For some of us, it would take a long time. For others of us, it would take less time. To account for every bird as to even know when one falls to the ground is a practice in excessive care and attention that borders on pointless. And yet, in the midst of all the disruption of peace that Jesus is talking about, in the midst of all the social strife and the familial fighting, the villainizing of the good news as evil, even to the point of killing it, what does it mean that God is found in the tedious care of counting hairs and plotting the flight of birds? It means to me that God is not determined by the situation that we are in. The fear that we hold does not control the caring of God for us or for others. The violence of false peace will not deter God's determination of peace. The human cost of discipleship is instead a way into life, losing it to gain it, releasing it to find it. Every hair or just one sparrow, nothing is too great or small to be beyond the scope and care of God. So do not be afraid. Don't count the cost, because you cannot. 
Either dive into the way of Jesus or don't tread at all. There is no half measure of peace worth finding. Blessed be the peace of Christ come to live among us. As we begin our time of communion together, um, I'll pause for just a second. If you, by chance, forgot to grab something from uh, your kitchen, grab two elements, a dry element and a liquid element. There are no rules about this. That we eat together because we need to. We eat together because that's the example that Jesus gave us. It matters not what you eat. It matters that we share it together. God in Christ breaks down the walls that make us strangers to ourselves and divide us from one another. And we are persistently the body of Christ. And around this table, around our own tables, we enact our faith together. The body broken is gathered, yet instead of walls, restoration. The lifeblood poured out is gathered, yet instead of being rendered dead, community gathers in persistent life. At this table, we receive God's peace made food. God's solidarity with us made living and real. What we receive, we now share together. May God be with you. Gather in our hearts. Let us give thanks to God among us. Creating God, we give thanks that you brought this world and all of humanity into being, breathing life into us. You show yourself in each face we encounter, each and all created in your image. We thank you for your promise of care for us. You teach us how to serve and how to love and to honor each other. In order to bring us into relationship with you, you sent us prophets and teachers, and we offer thanks that when we ignored your embrace, you persisted in reaching out to us. We thank you for the life and ministry of Jesus. The death and resurrection of Christ taught us among many things that nothing, not even death, can separate us from you. And the reflection and celebration that all of our caring brings within the voices sharing our vision, the proclamations and affirmations of your beloved, gather us, your church, to be living reminders of the depth of love found in your presence among us. And through your Holy Spirit, you breathe through us, gathering us as your church. And we remember the night that Jesus gathered with his friends and disciples. During the meal, he took a loaf of bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And he offered himself and said, whenever you eat together, do so in remembrance of me. And in a similar way, as the meal was ending, he took the cup. And upon giving thanks, he said that this cup is the new covenant the overflow of life that I bring. Drink it, and as often as you do, do so in remembrance of what this covenant stands for. So now, leading God, bless those gathered here. Together with this bread and cup through the outpouring of your Holy Spirit, through this meal, make us one household, the church, your servant people, that we may be the bread and cup shared for God's hope for the world. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. If you would share with me the bread of life shared among friends.
cup a blessing shared for all. You would please join me in our prayer of thanksgiving. God, source of our life, bless with boldness and caress with care. Christ, wisdom of God, bless with boldness and caress with care. Spirit, midwife of new beginnings, bless with boldness and caress with care. If you would join me for our closing hymn, it's number 82, it's on page 7 of your bulletin, His Eye is on the Sparrow.
God's eye may be on the sparrow, but um, good luck keeping your eye on those lyrics of the hymn, that's for sure. Um, we sang one, three, and then two, and then kind of moved around a little bit. Caroline did perfect. Uh, Chris and I did less than perfect. Um, but who cares? We're good, right? Uh, as we go from today, uh, as a reminder, if you want to join the council meeting, please type um, uh, council in the chat to make sure that I get you in the right room. But as, as you go on uh, with your day today, into a world that seems lacking in all kinds of peace, that seems to not be able to find it anywhere, that the care of God is persistent, that the care of God is unending, And in that, we will forever be able to say that we fear not. Go in peace.